Well, uh, gee, everything was going so well. <laughs> and, and everything worked, and uh, we took goods from China, and then China took dollars and then put the dollars back in here. What happened? Everybody now says, oh, China's coming up, America's going down. What happened? Or, or, or it's all the fall of the banks on Wall Street and so forth. Um, we, we just had a multi-year, or some say multi-decade period where we lived beyond our means. We used leverage, we used debt. Um, and it all came back to really haunt us in the housing market. The housing market is a key asset. We leveraged off it. We kept loaning and using it as collateral. But at the end of the day, it wasn't necessarily a shell game or a Ponzi scheme. I, I wouldn't see it that way. But this is a country that's lived well beyond its means for quite some time. And it, and it really kind of ran out of control, ran off the rails. And now we, we're going to reset and begin again. But in that time, and this is after 9-11, you say in the book that maybe 9-11 did not have a great effect on the, on the economy. But I think, I think, that doesn't matter, uh, that interest rates were kept down and the, the world, really, America became the consumer nation so that China, India, and so forth could develop, could get up exports and send to, to, to us. Uh, this was uh, invalid or it just went too far or what? No, I think 9-11 is an inflection point, uh, and I mentioned this in the book. It was a trigger for the United States becoming more deeply involved in the Middle East, waging two wars that ultimately cost uh, a trillion dollars, if not three trillion dollars, according to some estimates. And the costs are still with us. And, you know, we were, de we were, we were a debtor nation before 9-11, and then after 9-11, we, we, we dug deeper into the hole. Um, the collateral damage of 9-11 wasn't that great, relatively speaking. And you're right, Jim, in the sense that Mr. Greenspan really did prime the pump and, and press the dollars out, that you saw very strong growth. I mean, growth, real GDP growth, about 5% in 2003, four, five, and six. And it culminated with the S&P and the Dow and all these global indices hitting their all-time highs in October 2007. Then it all went off the rails. And in that time, with America over-borrowing, over-spending, over everything, these other countries, other parts of the world, came up. This is the rise of the rest, as it's called, including places that were always, Brazil used to be called the the nation of the future, and it always will be, but now it's the nation of the present, and mm -hmm. China, and India, and Singapore, well, smaller places too. What, what's, the, what's, the, um, what's the portent of that? They were going to keep developing? They're going to... I, I think they have, I and mean, I talk about this in the book, I said, kind of an inflection point. Between 1990 and 2005, um, it's estimated that the global labor force doubled when you put in India and China and the, and the communist uh, Soviet Union collapse of communism, Central Europe, it doubles. So you have a deflationary shock. You've got all this supply, a lot of, a lot of workers out there, leveraged by U.S. corporations, European corporations. And so there's a lot of workers who produce a lot of goods for you and I at very low prices, and we had a, an increased our standard of living on top of the easy credit conditions. And what happened, I think, around 2005, 2006, these workers became consumers. And as I talk about in the book, now they're consuming energy. Now they're, they were buying so, uh, soybeans, the protein, corn, the copper that comes with more building. They're a legitimate contender when it comes to be, being price setters as a price taker. So I think we got a new dynamic there. It was a, it was a, we saw the kind of the supply side shock with these new workers. Now we're seeing this, the demand side shock. But, it's, it, but to me, it's exciting. I mean, if you talk to U.S. corporations, particularly multinationals, they've been never more excited about what's happening in the emerging markets. But we shouldn't take that to be, however, that they're going to rule the world. I think there's a lot of work on both ends here, whether it's the West or the rest. Emerging markets doing better and the multinational American companies being excited and a lot of business being done. What does this do? We have 9.3% uh, unemployment in the United States, 13% unemployment in Los Angeles, by the way. Uh, are, where, where are the jobs for here? Because that's a, that's no, a potent that, no, question. That's, that's a potent question. An inflammatory question, question here. Right, and I'll try to answer it quickly, but I, I kind of start that 9.3% unemployment rate and kind of slice and dice it. Amongst college-educated workers with four-year degrees, that's considered skilled labor. That's, you, know, we, you can argue with that or not. Um, that's skilled labor. The unemployment rate's 4.4% in this country. The other problem to me is that we don't have enough manufacturing skilled labor out there, whether it's Boeing, whether it's Ford. Ford wants to hire engineers to build the electric car. Well, good luck. Where are you going to find these people? 
because we don't produce them out of our universities. Boeing, Microsoft is always looking for skilled labor as well. At the other end, we've got 50 million American workers in this country who have a high school education or less. And there, the unemployment rate is around 15, 16%. And if we're in an economy, we're competing against the Chinese and the Brazilians and so forth, and we're not going to build as many homes, because we're not, we don't need as, we've got a lot, then you're going to see these people have a hard time be put back into the economy and retrained and reskilled and become an economic input. Now they're a drag, but how do we pull them back in? That's the big issue. And in the meantime, I would say, when you, when you look at, say, General Motors, they're building, you know, you build where you sell. You build where you sell. That's why General Motors makes cars in China. And there's incentives to be in China as well, just like there's incentives to be here in the United States. But that doesn't mean that, that all that General Motor production doesn't filter back into the U.S. workforce. It, it helps. The more General Motors sells cars in China, the more General Motors has revenue to pay for their liabilities, their legacy costs, marketing, engineering back here in the U.S. So it's not a, it's not a zero-sum game. You're saying that we have a shortage of skilled workers in the United States. Well, the answer is simple, as everybody here knows. Education. Do we have problems with our education? This is How much time do we have? We have lots of problems with our education. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we used to think in the United States that when a high school, or when, a, when, when a student entered high school in the urban areas of the United States, LA in particular, New York, um, 70 or 80 percent actually graduated. Well, now we know it's really 70%. Actually, when they enter high school, they actually graduate with that degree. In some place like South Korea, it's around 98, 99% in, in terms of the graduation rate. Um, I live outside of Philadelphia. Only around 30, 35% of the students who enter high school in urban Philadelphia actually graduate. In Detroit, it's 25%. I mean, just think of those numbers. 75% don't graduate. So hence, we're losing a key economic input very early because they don't go to college. They don't know the math skills. And this is a big issue. If you talk to multinational corporations, they are worried about the skill level of our economy. And, the, and I like the German apprenticeship system that they have. Um, they, the Germans, whether they pay a lot, it's expensive, but I do think that they have the right system. And I'll give you another example related to that, Jim. Siemens did something very interesting. What did they do, big German company? They are going towards lifetime employment. I think U.S. companies should think about lifetime employment for their best employees that know how to make a locomotive in Erie or a computer scientist in Seattle. But, so Siemens and the private companies continue the education of, the, of, of yes, people? So, yes. In the old days, classically as we know, uh, there were jobs for people who didn't quite finish high school, but now there, are no, there aren't jobs for them because the economy has become more technical. You need, need to have the technical skills. Uh, are we going to rely on the private sector? Are we going to reform education? Do you get into that in, in the book? Uh, yeah, I do talk about that in the book. One, one thing, just talking to clients and going around, well, I mean, let's just stop blaming China for everything that ails the United States. I mean, I, you know, when, if, it's, if, it's, if it's snowing in New York, it must be China's fault. You know, or something. We, I'm sure there's someone out there who can make the connection. Um, in the last campaign, there were 29 anti-Chinese uh, commercials. Out there, and I, I found out. And if you're sitting in China and you're thinking like, "Wow, why, why are we giving these guys money if, if they're treating us so badly? We're the debtor; they're the creditor." Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I look very carefully at the public school system. What, you know, we have the problem is and everyone knows this, particularly California. The states are in a lot of trouble right now, and we're spending more money taking care of the elderly and in the public sector unions as opposed to the youngsters with education. That's a choice we're making, and I, I know, competitively speaking, the president can speak in, until he's blue in the face, but that's a huge disconnect. And when it comes to state financing. Also, China is in the news because, at least in Shanghai, there was a model school that educated, and, and truth be told, youngsters in China, India, and other countries. India is a little shaky, but South Korea and most of Asia, where two-thirds of the world's people uh, under 30 live, uh, they have higher skills, higher education levels than the United States. But China, you're, you're very good on China, and, and some things come out about China, which people, as, as Joe says, are is being held up as some kind of villain. China has an unemployment problem, too. It has a lot of people, and its economy is growing 10.3% in the latest figures. But please tell us, about, tell us about China's problem with unemployment, greatest migrant greatest migration of people in the history of the world, et cetera, from the countryside to the cities. I don't know where to begin. I mean, I'll just start with the Chinese consumer. Um, they save a lot. Um, 
you know, we are 70% personal consumption, 70% of the GDP here in the United States. In China, it's half that. It's 35%. The Chinese consumer is not a driver because they're saving, and they have to because they don't. The iron rice bowl has been taken away, so they have to save for education, health care, their pension, their retirement. Um, if you get sick in China, you can go broke. And I guess we same thing could happen here in the United States, I imagine. So, <laughs> I, I should qualify that as well, uh, where where we're going. But but nevertheless, you know the Chinese are worried, and they spend a lot of money on education. We talk about education in China; it, it's not cheap, and because you know there's a huge premium on that. And so what in China, too, very interesting, just in the last decade or so, they've had much more people graduate from colleges. I and mean, colleges are sprouting up quite dramatically in India and China. So these college graduates coming out, however, they don't have jobs. I mean, they're not, they're not paying jo high paying jobs. And there's a recent survey in China, it's very interesting, 70, 75% of the people in the present labor force, particularly amongst the young, younger workers, they would rather work for the state than the private sector because they feel more secure about the state. But here's the problem. State enterprises are also continuing to shed workers as well. And then the ultimate kicker is going to be what? Real wages in China in the, manu in the manufacturing sector, they're, they're rising by 20 to 25 percent. And you're also seeing the currency appreciate. I mean, we always talk about the currency hasn't appreciated. That's nonsense. Since say, around two, two, June 2005, the currency has appreciated by 25, 30 percent in that range. So think about it. Guangdong province, I look at it today, the big exporting powerhouse of China, they're exactly where Ohio was in the 1980s, where rising wages, stronger currency, what do you have to do? You've got to fire half of this side of the room, and you have to train these people how to use a, a machine to be competitive. That's what's happening, and that will increase the amount of layoffs, so it's a big issue. Most people would rather work for the state in China. Absolutely. This, in all of the arguments that are floated today about, oh, well, this is the end of free market capitalism, there's a better model in Asia. China is a better model, and this is a state-run model that is being held up. I, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying actually that Hu Jintao or anybody is coming out and saying we are a better model, but a lot of economists are saying they're a better model. You, you would question that, I take it. I would challenge it a little bit. I mean, you know, the Chinese, the Brazilians, the Indians, they, they, they do lay the blame of the financial crisis on the United States, and that's legitimate. We, we did have uh, Wall Street run amok, so to speak, but there was lax regulation from Washington and so forth. But however, being lectured by the Chinese when they control the capital formation, the, the credit and the lending, I don't think that's the answer either. So I mean, that, that's in India, so these, these, these markets where the banking sector is very much state controlled or state influenced. I don't think that's the answer as well. But I will give China credit in the sense that they are pushing on the frontiers of clean energy, electric cars, uh, bullet trains. They're, they're pushing into new frontier markets that we should be doing as well. So maybe they are a model. Um, you know, the Beijing consensus, I don't think anyone even knows what that means, let alone Beijing. And, and that's out there. But I can tell you this, the Washington consensus, i.e., you know, free markets, deregulation, financial sector, global capital flows, that has been seriously devalued in the last couple of years. And in the 1980s, as everybody here remembers, uh, it was always Japan is going to rule the world, Japan is going to have all the industry, and American companies can make baskets or something. And this didn't occur, this really didn't develop and Japan came a cropper. China is much larger than Japan. Uh, now its economy is larger, and of course the country is larger. Uh, Japan invested here. Toyota makes cars. Toyota has 10 centers in the United States. China is starting to invest in the United States. They've bought in Saginaw, Michigan, a, a, a former GM uh, auto parts company. In, Hun in Huntsville, Alabama, they bought a, an aerospace parts company. Uh, Charles Wolf, a local scholar, says that China's investments has only just begun. What, are, what do you think will be the pattern of uh, China, Chinese company and maybe backed by Bank of China? Or Bank of America. You know, or Bank of <laughs> no, I, I hope Charles is right, but I do think um, the Chinese are a little gun shy. Originally stepped in to buy a petroleum company here in the United States and were told to you know, go away. Um, they're embarrassed by that. Uh, there's some investment protectionism brewing uh, in the United States and China as well. So I, I think it's very important that we do have this. We, 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 I wrote about this in the sense that 
you know, we, China has a trade advantage over us, so they have a huge trade surplus, we got a huge trade deficit, but we have a huge investment advantage over China, i.e. our companies are in China making lots of money. Now the Chinese want to be in our markets, being over here on the ground, but it's difficult to do. It's very hard, um, I think of Hyundai, the South Korean car company, when they first entered the United States, they stumbled, they, they lost a lot of money, they had to go home and rethink, how do we do this? It's very hard to go global, but good Chinese companies they don't want to trade, they want to invest, they want to be on the ground. And I think that's the, the growing trend. And if I was running California, one of the first things, I'd probably spend more time in Beijing than in Sacramento, because I'd be laying out the welcome mat for a lot of Chinese, Taiwanese, Korean companies to come here and invest. And you, Jim, you talked about the Japanese coming to the United States, and isn't it ironic, how did the Japanese car makers get here? They got here because of basically misguided, and I'm using a nice term here, misguided trade policy from from the United States, uh, our, our elected officials in Washington. Remember the export voluntary restraints, you know, the, the quotas and kind of that we placed on Chinese or Japanese cars? So what did the Japanese do? They said, well, okay, if we can't export them, we're just going to make them right in your backyard in Kentucky and Ohio. And you know what they do? Ch we invited Japan right into our backyard and they, they ate Detroit's lunch and then some. So that was all about skip, hopping over the barriers. China would like to do the same thing. So I'm excited about that. I mean, I'd like to see more Chinese investment in German investment. We're in Southern California, but if you go to the southeastern part of this country, yeah. it's amazing the kind of the, the languages you hear in, say, South Carolina, about, you know, the BMW plant, or Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee. We have a thriving manufacturing base, and thank God it's being helped and being driven by these foreign transplants. And I hope China is a big part of that. Yeah, you make that point very well in the book. The book is a warning. This is, this is not a happy book in, in that sense. Chapter 8. <laughs> Oh, well, we have the, uh, the uh, economic Cold War. What could come of this time with the usual mix of unrest and fear in America plus unemployment? And a lot of, well, <laughs> we see it. Uh, what, could the, what could cause an economic Cold War, and do you see it developing in real time, as they say today. I mean, when you hear the Brazilian finance minister talking about currency wars, um, and you know, Brazil's raising uh, capital investment inflow barriers, taxes, and to, keep, to keep your money out, uh, to protect their own kind of monetary fiscal positions. Um, that, that to me is kind of, a, kind of a sign of a Cold War, economic Cold War. Resource nationalism, resource hoarding. China owns you know, 98, 99% of rare, mineral, rare earth minerals. Um, that they, they, they were hoarding them allegedly uh, earlier last year. And to me, it's just simply this. An economic Cold War doesn't have to happen, but we, we have to start listening to each other. I'm not a big fan of the G20, but I'm happy there's a lot more people sitting around the table. And I think the, the new folks, whether it's you know, South Africa, whether it's Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, of course, India and China, they have to be responsible global stakeholders. I mean, and they have to do things for the global commons. They're not accustomed to doing that. They do things for India, they do things for China. The United States and Europe, I'll give them credit, in the last 60 years, they're the global architects of this great global economy we have. They, they, they've, they've looked out for the global commons, in a sense, like free trade, security, free flow of oil out of the Middle East. We pay for that. That's not cheap. It's very expensive. But I do think the United States could, could learn a little bit from the Chinese, the, the, the Turks, and so forth, and people in South Africa. So we've got to start listening. Stop talking and start listening. Because if we don't listen to each other and, and, and respect what we're saying, then we will part ways. And G20, to me, it, it, it's, it was successful early on, but it's kind of stumbled a little bit here. We never talk about Doha. I mean, Doha, no one, talk, no, no one on Wall Street talks about Doha, but it's hugely important. The development trading round is hugely important, but I'd say it's dead on, dead on arrival. And this, is, you know, and this is an area where you know, we're seeing bilateralism, um, these, these uh, free trade agreements sprout up all over Asia. Ch China's out doing deals with Southeast Asia, Japan, now Australia. We're being boxed out. So what I worry about, we turn inward because we blame unemployment on China. We blame uh, the lack of service jobs on India, and we kind of part ways. And I think that's still a risk. One thing that is never mentioned, uh, but when you get into natural resource and the need for natural resources, especially oil around the world, is the U.S. military. The U.S. military is the reason that Saudi Arabia <laughs> exists, let's say, uh, that the Middle East pumps out the oil and sends it around the world, and the fact that you can use the, uh, the oceans to transport oil peacefully. Uh, could an economic Cold War, is there a danger of a hot war? 
with this kind of thing. I mean, that, that's, that's a bit of an extreme, but well, but might no, as well but ask it. Jim, it's a good point because when you look at what Iran's doing, uh, there, there's a divide, you know, Iran versus Saudi Arabia. That's the real tension point, the Sunnis versus the Shiites. Um, and there's an arms race underway in, in the Middle East, unequivocally. The more Iran presses their nuclear capabilities, the more the other countries, whether it's Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, they want to buy arms for the United States. So we're, we're very much part of that equation. There's an arms race underway in Asia. Uh, unequivocally, with North Korea, China stepping out, now South Korea, Japan, they've ramped up Vietnam. India, of course, lives in a very dangerous neighborhood. So will it turn hot? I mean, I, I think that, that's more of a flashpoint. I mean, I'm watching very carefully what's going on in Tunisia and Egypt. You know, hopefully that stays localized and doesn't go global. And I, I don't think it's going to go global. But hot war, no. Not, and, and between the United States and China, at the end of the day, I mean, there, there's, a, there, there's cool heads running both countries. In the, in, the, in the military and also uh, the governments. I just don't see that happening. But I, I will just throw this out. I mean, why is it? I mean, to me, why don't we kind of outsource patrolling the Indian Ocean and the Gulf lanes the, as the oil comes out of the Gulf? Why don't we outsource that and let China pick up some of the burden? So if they want to build a navy and kind of make sure that the oil is flowing freely out of the Middle East, go for it. I think that, that I'm, I'm, I'm OK with that. And you, maybe people a, lot, say, a lot of nations of Asia are not OK with that. Yeah, but I, I think we should kind of, kind of outs, outsource. This is part of the glo global commons, right? And people say, well, that's really naive. Not really. When you think about that we cannot afford to keep spending money, we, we spend $12 billion a month, a month, in, our, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're closing schools in this country. Now, there's a disconnect there. Wow. Well, if, if we are going to stop that and if we are going to try things like a change in the world's power base, uh, as you say, uh, the countries of the West, that would be the United States and Europe, plus Japan, but especially the United States and Europe, are going to have to let other countries, especially China, Brazil, countries that really are developing, and of course China is a great and ancient civilization, in on the, uh, you know, a seat at the table and a voice and, and a, you know, that cannot be stopped by veto. In other words, a, a true partnership. Your last chapter is the, the, the brighter future. After chapter eight, which says economic cold war, we're all, we're all in peril. Then the last chapter is cooler heads, intelligent progress going forward. Could you describe what you see as progress? We're, we're in a bit of a funk here in the United States, I think, you, you know, where we say, I don't know what the heck is gonna happen. Uh, is, the, is the economy even growing? Yes, it's growing, but is it growing fast enough? What do, what do you see happening with, with the, the brighter perspective? I mean, the globalization is like trade, and the, the bicycle theory. You have to keep the bicycle moving forward at whatever speed so it doesn't fall over. Globalization, I mean, I'm, I'm worried about financial deglobalization, the capital markets being um, chopped up. But, you know, I think it's incumbent upon U.S. multinationals, U.S. policymakers, the Europeans, and the Chinese, and, the, and these other stakeholders in the emerging markets to realize that, you know, let's continue expanding the global economic pie. And, and it's a win-win proposition. And I just think that, that comes, you know, when China, when it comes to the currency, um, let's stop lecturing China about the currency. I mean, I always throw this out on Capitol Hill. You know, we, we told Japan to let their currency appreciate as well and let the dollar weaken. We would sell more and they would sell less and we'd correct the imbalance. It didn't happen, right? I mean, Japan, we still have a huge trade deficit with Japan because why? We like their products. They're cheaply made, they're efficient, and they're low cost. China provides a lot of products as well. So you, let's be intelligent about the kind of what, what our goals are and the objectives. So the, the, last, the last chapter is about globalization being re reincarnated. Maybe I'm optimistic because the next phase of globalization will not be have that made in America stamp on it. It's going to have a you know, made in China, made in Turkey, made in Brazil, made in Chile. And that's very exciting. And I, you know, I, I teach and, and I don't think, and I travel quite a bit. I, I, I did 16 emerging markets in four continents last year and that was kind of like an off year. But when you keep going back to the emerging markets, whether it's Africa, the Middle East, and so forth, you see the consumption, you see the confidence, you see U.S. companies involved, Western companies involved. And to me, it's, it's a great story, and it doesn't have to end badly. But I think we have to be smarter about, you know, what is the Chinese threat, yes, but what's the Chinese opportunity? Opportunity, this is the world of rising living standards everywhere, which has always been, I, I believe, certainly since World War II, has been an American ideal. That's the reason that the United States 
and all of its diplomacy and all of its military uh, has uh, tried to foster that, rising living standards in other countries. But you're, the institution, or maybe we don't have the institutions right now, the one you cite, the G20, uh, I don't, you know much better than, than I, but I, I think the G20 is already being questioned, discredited, like most things, you know. Uh, something is proposed one day, and the next day you read an article that says, this is nonsense, uh, the G20 is a, a threat to, yeah. I mean, I think mean, it's a little too early to call, you know, whether G20 is a success or failure, but they, they've got to do some work up in, in and around, um, you know, how do you, how, say Doha, how do you kick, how do you restart that? Uh, global climate change, I think this is a big issue as well. Um, and I'll give you an example, and I just think, you know, the West hasn't kind of gotten the memo yet, but I, there was, it was last week, if you saw this, two banks in China, two banks in China, they gave out more money, they, they, they loaned more money to the developing countries last year than the World Bank. That's the world we live in. And I don't think we, we've, we've figured out. The IMF, now they're, they're, you know, they, they're coming to the rescue of Europe and their, their mandate is to help financially troubled co countries. China's reserves are nine times larger than the IMF. Money talks. And chi China's playing checkbook diplomacy. And let's leverage that in the right way together somehow, some way. China, China and the United States, for Energy is a huge issue for both economies. We're big oil importers. We, we have a lot of coal. We, we have the same challenges in front of us. That's a bridge by which we should build so we can create other partnerships in other areas. If the American economy goes into another recession or something, what would this do to China or to Asia or to this, the world? It used to be that, well, as I said, in the last 10 years or part of it, uh, the whole world economy revolved around selling to America and being aided by. So what, what's the successor to that? China's large reserves, they're lending, but uh, is, is, will it remain a, an, an export-oriented economy, or can, will it develop? Uh, yeah, I, and I, in the course of development, what changes will we see there? Well, I mean, remember, China, you know, the media loves to point this out, they're the, they're the second largest economy in the world, but when you look at a per capita basis, they're still pretty poor. They're like 94, 95 ranked in the country, or in the world. And so they've got a lot of, lot of work to do yet, but they need to, you know, kind of rebalance that investment-driven, export-driven economy, make it more consumption-driven, but that takes time. We can't, you know, have a summit between the leadership in, in Beijing and the United States and make it work. You know, I said that 35% consumer makes up of the, of the economy in, 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 the, uh, in China. It used to be as high as 40, 45%. So they gotta, gotta start moving it in that direction. And they've gotta give the incentives, you know, less savings, make them feel secure, create some of that, that, that uh, uh, security by which they will spend more. And then conversely, here in the United States, remember at the height of uh, you know, the good times earlier in this century, um, the, the savings rate in the United States was zero. And it's gone back up to six. Like, wow, okay, zero to six. Um, but it should really be at 16. So we, we need to save more, consume less, and they need to do the opposite. And we, we can begin there. Even I am not old enough to remember the days before Social Security. But in the 1930s, we had a tremendous depression. And there was a song, Over the Hills to the Poor House, and that's what happened to people who grew old and didn't have the money. They went over the hills to the poor house. Then you had Social Security. We've had all of those reforms. Uh, from what you say in this book, where people save in China because, hey, they have to pay for their health care, they have to pay for their retirement, they have to pay for their children's education. Uh, will we see those kind of reforms? And in this country, we're already questioning the reforms we have, the Medicare and even Social Security, which is kind of a perennial. But uh, do you see our country having to go backward uh, a little on, uh, or how severely do we have to cut back on some of those assurances we had and how, and will China or other countries come forward with these rising living standards? Rising living standards will be there. It might not be as fast as China uh, as has in the last 30 years. But I, I think there's a very, Jim, it's a very good question because there's a very interesting experiment underway. And it's really between the United States and Europe and really the United States and the UK. Now, the UK's economy is very similar to the United States, consumption, finance, 
Uh, you know, we, we talk the same language sometimes, it seems, um, uh, but we're very similar. But what's happened in the UK? The Cameron government has really cut deeply into the public sector. I mean, they've really gone this direction, and they're going to cut, and they're being serious about their budget deficit. Here in the United States, however, we're, we're on, you know, the fiscal stimulus 2.0. We've got quantitative easing. What well, we're going to spend, and we're going to go this direction. It's going to be very interesting in 12, 18 months. Which one will the markets reward? Is it going to be the austerity of Europe, particularly the UK or, say, Ireland, or is it going to be the continued spending of the United States? That's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. And I do think what I don't like about the United States, what worries me about the United States, is that I've been on Wall Street long enough to know almost 30 years now, over 30 years, it's amazing how time flies. Um, but I, I grew up in this world on Wall Street that a financial crisis never happened in the United States. It's always in Mexico. It's always in Ukraine, Brazil, whatever. We had one, a doozy a couple of years ago. Now I hear the same kind of narrative. Well, whatever's happening in Greece and in Ireland, it could never happen here because we got the world reserves currency, we got great corporations. It can't happen here. It can happen here. Either we will reconcile our own fiscal house, we'll do it ourselves, or the markets might do it for us at some point down the road. Joe, I think today the National Commission on the Financial Crisis is issuing its report. I'm wondering if you've had a chance to preview the report or have gathered from media reports about what it will say. In your view, what does it have right in terms of its conclusions and recommendations, and where is it off the mark? I haven't gotten to Obama's speech yet, the, the, the State of the Union, just like, but I did see the headlines, David, in, in, in that sense. Um, you know, I'm not, there, there were some, I mean, the, the banks, I, I would, what else would the guy from Wall Street say um, in the sense that, you know, it wasn't all our fault? And it wasn't, really. I mean, if you look at presidents, you look at Federal Reserve chairmen, um, you look at, you know, the, the lax, the, 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 everything cratered. There's a lot of responsible parties, and first and foremost, obviously, is Wall Street. And, you know, we can't, and I, and I, I don't blame it on, the, you know, the excess savings in China, so they, you know, they made me, you know, take on all this leverage. Now, here again, it's always, you know, it's China's fault. Um, but I, I have to look at that. But, I, but more importantly, you, you, you raise reports, and what I didn't like, and, but the market applauded this, is that you know, shortly after the election last year, two deficit reduction committees, commissions came out and said, like, here's what you got to do, America. You know, here's how you got to tighten your belt. And what did we do? We, we, we ramped up another $850 billion in spending. So, I mean, if I was on that commission, I'd feel like, well, what did I just spend all this time doing for if you're not going to listen to me, and the leaders? So I'll have to look at the, the, the report. But, you know, my biggest issue to, to, your, to your answer um, is that I, I hope we, you know, whatever they recommend, we do it. We make it a better system and take the risk out and manage the risk better. My question has to do with the uh, the issue of emerging markets, international cooperation, and the market-based approach to climate change. Twenty years ago, my partner and I developed the first carbon offset project in Asia. Do you think that there is a market-based approach to dealing with global climate change? And do you see this as a business opportunity, or is it another emerging bubble like the South Sea island bubbles? What's your view on the market-based approach to what I consider the most pressing issue facing our species? I think it could be market-based at some point, but you need the public sector, you need governments in, in alignment to make it happen. So we're not there yet because we still have uh, disagreements about whether it's real or not, who's going to pay for it, developing versus develop, and so forth. So I don't think we're, we're there just yet. Um, here, here's an example. I always tell my clients, I mean, just, just tell me where I'm wrong, but you know, there are 60 new, 60 new nuclear power plants being built around the world, not one in the United States. So either they know something that we don't, or we're smarter than them. So, so there's a disconnect there. So when it comes to alternate energy, energy in, direct, in, in general, to me, it's a fossil fuel-driven global economy, for, I think, for quite some time, because it's just status quo. And, and I do think um, if, you, if we were serious about your you know, market-based global climate change, you'd need a gasoline tax. You, you need these incentives. And, and then the government has to be involved with the catalysts, you know, to start the process, give the incentives to companies to go down this path, take the chances, take the risk. But I, I don't think we're just there yet. And I was surprised, $147 a barrel of oil, that, you know, it, it got people thinking and, 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 you know, kind of tinkering, but it didn't catch. So what's it going to take? That's going to be the big issue. What's it going to take us for to kind of push? And, and, and I'll give China credit. I mean, they're, they're looking at electric cars, solar, wind. That upsets some people here in the United States, but I think, like, well, if, 
if China's smart enough and has the money to go down that path is, and they're successful, that's great. As long as they're willing to sell it to us, that's great. And I think they would be. So let's not you know, get all upset because they're pushing on the frontier of energy because we're not. I mean, I was on a bullet train in China and you know, I was with a Chinese colleague, he says, yeah, it only, goes only, it only goes 225 miles per hour. I said, only? I said, you been on the Acela lately? And he said, no, no. I, he says, we want to make this go 400 miles an hour. And you know, they're pushing that type of frontier. I mean, that's, that's their mentality. So we, we could lend, we could borrow that. But to, to answer your question, no, I don't think we're there yet. Hi, I wondered how you uh, saw the peak of energy, oil extraction, impacting restarting globalization. Lo so a long-term view of that. If, if there is a peak in oil, um, you know, I, I am concerned about that, and I, and I write about the book that, you know, the United States right now takes, in, in any given year, takes more money, takes more oil out of uh, Africa than they do the Middle East. Um, so, and there's a lot of problems there. And, but here again, if China wants to go in there and draw oil out of countries where we don't want to do business, uh, at least they're adding to the global supply. But here's, it's, to me, it's more on the demand side, to your point, peak oil. I, no, I don't think anyone really knows, but I do know this. In Asia, I think India, Japan, that swath of geography, there's three billion people. And there's still a lot of rapid urbanization. They're going to malls. They're driving cars, air conditioned. They're, they're, taking, they're requiring a lifestyle, slowly but surely, that you and I take for granted. However, beneath the ground, this swath of geography, the Asians only account for around 3% of proven oil reserves globally. 3%. It's a drop in a bucket. They account for about 10% of global production. Yet now they consume almost 35%. There's a huge disconnect between what they have underneath them versus what they're producing, what they're consuming. And this country, in my opinion, is sleeping at the switch while this is happening. It's not just the supply, it's the demand. And so I hope the Chinese, the Indians, uh, Indonesia, I hope they know how to use energy more efficiently because if they don't, you're not gonna pay the price. And if you looked on a per capita basis, China today, on a per capita basis, if China consumed as much energy as the United States, we'd have to double supply tomorrow. But here, you know, if, oil, if gasoline gets up above you know, a certain dollar mark in this country, it's like, call your congressman and, and complain. You know, what's going on? And so, so there's a huge disconnect. Part of my point of the book is that we haven't reconciled the fact that the, these consumers are out there and they're, they're setting prices. They're setting prices. We used to set the price. Now they are, and we're not ready for that. When you were talking about education, as, as a business school student, obviously, when we take our graduation or uh, our graduate admissions tests, where the, the percentiles are pretty skewed. Should you do okay in English, you can get a 90th percentile pretty easily, and it's pretty standard as a US student, you should be pretty good at English. In math, where you do okay, but the percentile, you might get a 70 or an 80, because it's so stacked at the top, and it's attributed to a lot of international students that learn math and do really well. But as the way we see it now, the U.S. is still kind of the premier destination for graduate school or colleges and universities, despite our high schools not doing nearly as well as theirs. Do you think at some point in our lifetime or in, in the near future that that'll change and the kind of implications of if China becomes the premier destination for colleges and universities? I, I mean, good question. that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I have... Um, I, I mentor a lot of Chinese uh, high school students in my town because we've had them stay at our home. And I'm always amazed. These are high school students, juniors and seniors. And I say, how's math coming? And, and it, this, I, I did this in fifth grade. And it's like, you know, pretty, pretty intense calculus based, you know, by American standards. Um, so that, uh, that, that, that's very interesting. But I, I think the challenge is for China, and they're looking at this very carefully, to create these premier institutions that will, you know, train. But, but how, China's very smart. Who's doing it for them? I mean, not, they're pulling in research and development centers of excellence from GE, IBM, the Europeans, and so forth. So they're building out their R&D capabilities from the private sector. And, but they have to have the universities as well. So here again, I mean, I don't have a problem with that as long as if, if the U.S. can reach in and, and, and hopefully have a chance at hiring that Chinese or Indian or Turkish person, that, that we, where it's a fair game. There is a way, I write about it in the book, that there is a war underway for brains, and it's intensifying. Because you know, a lot of Chinese people I know here, they still love America, but they think, well, why would I stay in an economy that's going to grow at 2 and 3% when I got an economy that's going to grow at 8%? Where's, where's my upside? It's over there as opposed to over here. 
and you know, it kind of, and it kind of, it kind of hit home to me. Um, I have a, a son that, you know, he's got a big college graduate degrees and so forth, and he's finding more opportunities in Southeast Asia and Cambodia and Thailand than he is here. He comes here in the United States, he gets depressed. And maybe it's me, but it, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's the job market over there instead. So I, you, we could see a lot of U.S. bright youngsters going elsewhere, and we haven't even thought about that because that's where the opportunities are. The largest genomic institute, meaning study of genomics and gene therapy and everything, is in Beijing. And there are seven institutes in Singapore called the Biopolis. And uh, all sorts of people, you don't have to be Asian to go home, uh, are welcome. Professors from San Diego are in Singapore working. So, yes, things are shifting, as yeah, your book but the, says. But, the, but, but Jim, I, to me, that excites me. And that's globalization without that made in America stamp. I mean, th yeah. that's exciting. If I, you know, I mean, if you're young, I mean, that, that's great opportunities. And I'd like to see them in Turkey and Egypt and Morocco, I mean, all over the world. Brazil's doing a lot of good things like that. You've talked a lot about uh, globalization, but what does all this mean uh, for unemployment in this country? And you mentioned also there were tax, there were incentives of various sorts to keep uh, companies here. What would you say are those, and how do they compare with the rest of the world? So it's kind of two, mm. two questions. Well, well, corporate taxes, relatively speaking, in the United States are amongst the highest amongst the developed countries. So we could start there. We've got to lower the corporate taxes, give the incentives for companies to hire, build out new capabilities, you know, have that kind of that, I, I don't like to, you know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of industrial policy, so to speak, but, you know, whether it's genomics, whether it's uh, uh, biotech, whether it's alternative energies, the, the government has to kind of lead the way, you know, say, here's, here's the playing field, uh, here's the goalposts, you know, go for it and create those jobs. But it's take, it takes time. And, and I just think here at home, as I mentioned, that, fifth, that the 50 million workers who have a high school education or less, we have to somehow you know, make them productive inputs. And not everyone needs a high school education, by the way, to be a productive input. Let me make that very clear. But we're losing, you know, people are going behind. They're falling behind. And how do we bring them forward? Uh, apprenticeship, out of, uh, like a la Germany, for instance, where you know, they work on a shop floor. We, we don't have enough workers in this economy that know how to weld things together. And, that's, and, and Jim, you mentioned this. The manufacturing, you know, we kind of think like nuts and bolts. No, it's computers and computer systems. It's very high end. It's very technical. And you need that training. So vocational training, it, it, number one. Number two, uh, you know, it makes, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say it. I'll, I'll get in trouble. Um, the, 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 the teachers, you know, I mean, ma ma make them rock stars, the good ones, and pay them well. I have no problem with that. Um, so th I think there's a lot of means within ourselves. And, and I write about in the book like the, the, the knowledge deficit. We, we don't understand how powerful we are. We've got a huge manufacturing base, great universities. We've got, for every dollar China received last decade, remember it's all about outsourcing, everything's going to China. That's all, that's all we ever read. For every one dollar China received last year in foreign direct investment, we got three dollars. You know why? Because of you. We're wealthy. We have money. We're skilled labor. We've got a good infrastructure. We've got a rule of law, transparency. Let's go sell that. You mentioned this vast 50 million underclass. Can you think of any contemporary model, any contemporary nation that's handled that underclass in a manner that's positive and functional that we could learn from? Well, I mean, underclass is your term. So, I mean, I don't know if they're underclass just yet, but I, I think they're falling behind. Um, they're, they're, they need the skills to compete in this uh, economy. Um, I, I think we could learn from, I keep going back to the German apprenticeship because I've seen it in these small, medium-sized companies where, and they, work, they stay there for life, these workers, and because they, they're, they're trained and it's highly skilled, whether it's you know, capital goods, whether it's textiles, whether it's footwear in Italy. Um, so I think th it's a big challenge for here. So, I mean, and, 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 and I don't, I don't, I, it worries me, but remember, I mean, we, we just came out of a decade of highly leveraged growth where finance and, and housing led the way and we're kind of resetting. We're, we're, so I think what's going to take time for these workers to get, you know, retrained, retooled and do something other, something with other than a hammer and be productive. It, it's just going to take time, but we need to, you know, you could argue, well, should we give them more unemployment benefits or should we give them a voucher to go get, an edu you know, get, get a skill, add to their toolkit? And this, this is a big issue. I talked with a woman yesterday. Um, she's a lawyer, and she, you know, her services just aren't as, as valuable as they once were because she's in real estate. 
she's going to have to go reinvent herself, so to speak. But, but she's obviously a trained worker, but how do you kind of make that turn and twist? I mean, and that, that's, that's, the, that's the issue. And I think, you know, U.S. corporations, two years hence, the, the crisis, they have been kind of shell-shocked. They, they are scarred. But they're sitting on record profits right now, and I do think as demand and consumer confidence comes back, they're going to start to put that money to work, and we begin again. We have a th I mean, I, I know it's not a lot of numbers, but when you hear like Ford Motors hiring 700 new engineers for the electric car, that's exciting, and there'll be all their knockout effects. But tell me where you're going to find those 700 new elect electrical engineers, and tell me if they're all going to be born in the United States, by the way. Well, if they're not born in the United States, they can immigrate here, but they, then you have to write another book about immigration. <laughs> I want to have a, a follow-up questions about what you just mentioned. It's all good about lifetime employment and apprenticeship. But I think in this country, what we hear a lot of time is that when a company cut their labor force, their stock price go up. And it has been happening uh, way too often. So what is the way to change that mentality? I, I don't know if that mentality will be changed, um, to be honest with you, because, I mean, we, we did, I think U.S. companies, I applaud them. They saw a collapse in demand, not only here and overseas, and they really severely and brutally, um, you know, c c righted their costs. Now they need to kind of start spending again. The unemployment rate in Germany didn't go up much because the state stepped in and they helped pay to keep the worker on the floor, um, at, not at the expense of totally of, of the company. So, I, so I, 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 I'm not sure, you know, how that all plays out, but, he, but here, but here, here, here's a good example. Isn't it ironic, and I think the number is like something like manufacturing employment over the last decade declined by 33%. I mean, a big decline in that range, right? And, but that's the story we're all here. Manufacturing employment d down dramatically. Here's the other side of the ledger. Output went up. That's what you call productivity. That's what you call earnings. That's what you call uh, kind of getting ahead. We've got to spread the wealth, I think, you know, more around the shop floor. But I don't worry about manufacturing employment coming down as long as output's going up, because that's exactly what China's going to have to do now. China cannot compete on unskilled labor anymore. That, that's over, and they know that. So I think technology has been a key driver of these lost jobs, not China. So if ch technology is, is kind of the culprit, so to speak, I also think it's part of the solution. And we get more people technologically savvy and make them a productive input takes time, yes, but then we begin again. But let's not blame manufacturing job losses on China, one, and number two, let's see it as a positive, not a negative. Now, that's easy for me to say, because you know, I'm not in Youngstown, Ohio without a job, but from a macro point of view, I think it's an point, important point to bring up. In your discussion, I heard that we have turned inward somewhat in the States. What I think is the theme of your book is that we need a mind shift to change our approach to globalization, see it differently, see it as an opportunity. Do you think uh, President Obama's State of the Union address uh, addressed that mind shift? Well, I mean, I, I, I remember his first State of the Union address, and um, I, I, you know, I was convinced I needed to write this book, and I was, I was going to end with the Cold War, in fact, not, not globalization reincarnate when I heard him speak. And, you know, and, and the Republicans and the Democrats being bipartisanship and the Dems talking about free trade, They're, you know, free trade is bad and so forth. Um, have we gotten the message yet? I mean, no, I here, here, but here, there's a disconnect, however. And I'm not going to blame this on the president, but it's his goal. He wants to double exports in five years. That's very no, and so do I. But not exports, just commercial business. We're not an exporting nation. We don't export Starbucks. We don't export cars, so to speak. We make them in China. We sell Starbucks in Paris. McDonald's is a phenomenal company that does fabulously around the world. And so Coke, we don't export bottles of Coke. We, we, we do it locally. So he's got the right idea. Let's double global commerce in a year. But how do you do that? You have to make sure that the Chinese market stays open. You have to make sure that the Chinese companies come here. Because if you look at, say, just trade between Germany and the United States, I'll give you a good example. So Germany has a BMW plant in South Carolina, right? So they're making cars here. That's true. But they're also pulling in parts from Germany and sending parts back, creating trade. Investment drives trade, and not the other way around. That's how it used to be. So we have to be like, how do we, how do we increase the, the kind of the, the, the global field? Foreign affiliate sales, OK? That, you know, think Starbucks in Paris, McDonald's in uh, I don't know, Turkey, whatever. 
five trillion dollars a year versus our exports that are 1.6. Which one do you want to emphasize? Exporting is for farmers, not for good companies, small or large. That's the key. So there's a disconnect. So I mean, I applaud the, the goal, let's go for it. Um, we can't use the cheap dollar to do it, by the way, and that's not the goal, I don't think. But I think he's got the right message, but I'm not sure people on Capitol Hill have. Because they, that's, all politics are local, right? They go home to an unemployment rate that's double digits. You talk about globalization and problem of outsourcing that we have. Uh, you talk about like not enough skilled labor in the United States to do those jobs. So I wanted to learn from you. Uh, U.S. is cracking down on outsourcing, jobs going out of the country. How do we tackle that problem? We don't have enough skilled labor and we're putting a stop on outsourcing. How does the uh, U.S. handle that situation and get those jobs back into the U.S. just to help the economy? I mean, I, I, would, I would just have an deb honest debate about insourcing. I mean, we, we do insource a lot as well, and that's inviting those companies here. As I said, I mean, you go to Kentucky, um, I mean, I talk to people at Toyota, I mean, they have very, the, the people who work for Toyota in parts of Kentucky in the southeastern part, they're very happy. They get paid good wages, they feel secure about their jobs, the community. We need more of that. There's outsourcing, yes, but there's, there can also be a lot more insourcing. And I'll give you the latest numbers. For, 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 for 2010, the United States attracted $186 billion in foreign direct investment in 2010. China, about $100 billion. Not bad, but not even close to the United States. So we're still a magnet for foreign direct investment because of you. Let's leverage that. Leverage that intelligently. That's the key issue. Okay, with that, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much.